Well, I want to invite you to join me in 1 John chapter 2 once again this morning as we begin, uh, or excuse me, as we continue our study uh, in the book of 1 John. This morning we will be looking at verses 18 through 27. And so as you find your place in 1 John chapter 2, please stand as we will read God's Word together and then look at these verses together as well. 1 John chapter 2, beginning in verse 18, the Word of God reads, Children, it is the last hour, and just as you heard that Antichrist is coming, even now many Antichrists have appeared. From this we know that it is the last hour. They went out from us, but they were not really of us, for if they had been of us, they would have remained with us, but they went out, so that it would be shown that they are not all of us. But you have an anointing from the Holy One, and you all know I have not written to you because you do not know the truth, but because you do know it, and because no lie is of the truth. Who is the liar but the one who denies that Jesus is the Christ? This is the Antichrist, the one who denies the Father and the Son. Whoever denies the Son does not have the Father. The one who confesses the Son has the Father also. As for you, let that abide in you which you heard from the beginning. If what you heard from the beginning abides in you, you also will abide in the Son and in the Father. This is the promise which he himself made to us, eternal life. These things I have written to you concerning those who are trying to deceive you. As for you, the anointing which you received from him abides in you, and you have no need for anyone to teach you. But as his anointing teaches you about all things and is true and is not a lie, and just as it has taught you, you abide in in him. Thank you. You may be seated. A question to begin the sermon. What do you think of when you hear the word antichrist? For some, it may be a politician or possibly an in-law. <laughs> On a more serious note, many think of a singular predominant figure that burst on the scene just before Jesus returns. In the past, people have thought men such as Nero, Napoleon Bonaparte, Mussolini, and Hitler were the Antichrist. But rather than there's just one singular predominant figure who burst on the scene just prior to Jesus' return, John has some important information for us that we need to see today. And as I read those verses, you can understand as you were following along how easy it is to kind of get caught up and a little confused with what all John is trying to say. But nonetheless, it is the Word of God and it is there for our benefit. And so this morning as we look at these verses, because we are going through this book verse by verse, line upon line, I want to invite you to follow along as we look at these uh, several verses, verses 18 through 27 together. In doing so, there are numerous headings, but I believe that as we walk through these, that they are, uh, for the most part, very to the point and very clear. And so I will preach fast if you will listen fast. First of all, I want you to see the declaration in verse 18. John begins this section by declaring the imminent danger that surrounds his readers because of the false teachers and their false doctrine that's in their midst. And so John writes, children, which is a term of endearment, communicating his love for them. And he's just written in the previous verses how they are not to love the world uh, and the things of the world, but that they are to love God and to do the will of God. And that individual who does that is the one who will live and who will abide forever. And now he's turning to this subject and he says, children, it is the last hour. 
He does not say it was the last hour. He does not say it will be the last hour. He says it is, present tense, now the last hour. And in this, John is communicating the urgency and the danger that is around them. This term, last hour, uh, communicates and refers to the entire period between Christ's first coming and Christ's second coming. It is the final moments in human history as God began time in Genesis chapter 1 and we read in the beginning and we read throughout the pages of Holy Writ, God's recorded history of human history, which in short is his story. We then come to the New Testament and the Son of God coming on to the scene of human history and him being the God-man and all that he accomplished. And so now we today as these believers are living in the last hour. And so John writes in the last part of verse 18, just as you heard that Antichrist is coming. In other words, John says, just as you have heard that in the final moments before Jesus returns that there will be this predominant figure, this great enemy of God, this individual who is referred to in other places in Scripture as the man of sin and the son of perdition, just as you have heard, he is coming. Now before we move any further, what is Antichrist? What does that mean? What is this term? It is a word that is only used by John in John's writings in the Bible. Yet it means to be against Christ. It means to be in opposition to Christ, to be unlike Christ. And so with this in mind, reminding them of this figure who will one day come on the scene, look at what John says on the heels of that at the end of verse 18. Even now... Many antichrists have appeared. In other words, we don't have to wait until the final moments just before Jesus returns to come in contact with antichrist. They are here and they have been here. They are those who deceive and deny the teachings of Christ and the teachings and doctrines of his apostles. And these are so dangerous that John is writing about here because they're in the church. They are individuals who appear to be godly. Paul even writes and says that the false teachers, uh, that the devil's teachers appear as angels of light. They will appear and seem like godly men. Jesus himself even said in Mark chapter 13 verse 22 that false Christ and false prophets will arise and will show signs and wonders in order to lead astray, if possible, even the elect. I said a while ago at the end of verse 18, but now we are actually at the end of verse 18. And so John says from this, from what? From the fact that many antichrists are already around us, we know that it is the last hour. We know that the one true Christ has truly come and that since he has come, there are those who are trying to subvert him. There are those who are trying to imitate him. There are those who are trying to lead away his people, his sheep, before his second coming. And so John simply says in verse 18 that this is the last hour of human history. And these are times that are especially dangerous because of all the antichrists that are around us. In verse 19, I want you to see the desertion. With this being communicated, John now gives one of the characteristics of an antichrist. How can you recognize an antichrist? John says, they, the false teachers, these antichrists, they went out from us. In other words, they departed, they defected, they deserted the church to pursue their own ways. And John even communicates, but that they were not really of us. In other words, their desertion revealed who they truly were. The fact that they deserted the church, the truth, the gospel reveals that they were never truly saved to begin with. 
John goes on to explain in verse 19, For if they, the false teachers, had been of us, if they had been truly saved, they would have remained with us. They would have continued in the community of Christ. They would have continued in the truth of the gospel. They would have continued and remained in the body of Christ. Verse 19 goes on to say, But... In other words, in direct contrast to remaining with the church, instead, what did they do? John says they went out. They went out their own way, deserting the truth, deserting the church. And John says, so that the result being, so that it would be shown that they all are not of us. The fruit shows that the faith wasn't real. Do you see that? We've come across this so many times in my short time with you over this past year and a half, haven't we? In Colossians, in 1 John, in numerous other places, here we see it again. That the false teachers who abandon the gospel, abandon the truth, who go and begin to preach their own gospel, their own way of salvation, are those individuals who are revealing their true colors. They are revealing that they never were truly of Christ. And the word all in here includes the ones that the false teachers lead astray with them. In other words, what John is saying is that this has not caught God by surprise. But they have gone out and they have left us and they have all gone out, even the ones that the false teachers deceived and led astray so that, in other words, God is even using this. God is even using Antichrist, the spirit of Antichrist. He is using false teachers to purge his body, to purge his church of false converts, false teachers, and false false doctrine. 1 Timothy 4, 1 says, the Spirit explicitly says that in the latter times some will fall away from the faith paying attention to deceitful spirits and the doctrines of demons. That's what we're reading about. That's what John is warning about. Thirdly, I want you to see the discernment. Which seeing what the Antichrist have done and who they are, John says and turns to his readers now in verse 20 and says, but you, you the true believers that I'm writing to, you on the other hand have an anointing from the Holy One and you all know. Now, this word anointing is a word that we see thrown around quite a bit. If you turn on so-called Christian television, you'll hear this word thrown around a a lot and being misused. And that's exactly why John uses it here. It's because the Gnostics were misusing it so much. They were claiming a special anointing from God, a special knowledge that the average believer did not have. And because of their special knowledge and their special anointing, they had these special dreams and visions and revelations that that you wouldn't just get from the Word of God. No, this would have to come directly from the Lord Jesus himself in a vision or an angel or some emanation. But John says, no. In contrast to these antichrists, you are the ones, true believers, who have an anointing from the Holy One, and you all know. You, the true Christian, are the one who has this anointing from God who knows the truth. And so what is this anointing that John is writing about? It is the ministry of the Holy Spirit in the life of every true believer to equip them in the truth and to preserve them from error. If any man hath not the Spirit of Christ, he is what? He is none of his. But the Spirit bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. Not that we might be, not that we hope we will one day be, but that we are the children of God. Why? Because when we were saved, we received the the witness of the Holy Spirit, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. And so Paul writes to the Colossian church and says, it is Christ in you, presently, Christ in you, the hope 
of glory. That is the anointing that we have. And so, verse 21, John says, I have not written to you because you do not know the truth. This is not to inform you, but because you do know it, because you do have this anointing, and because there is no lie that is of the truth. That is to say, because you do know the truth, and you do have the Holy Spirit bearing witness with your spirit to what is true, you will know that what I'm writing to you is the truth. And you will know that there is no lie that is from the truth. Now, that, that, that could be a tongue twister, I understand. Uh, you remember whenever James writes and says that uh, bitter water and sweet water can't come from the same well, and he's talking about the tongue and our conversation. It's, it's basically that same concept. That if something is truth, it is an impossibility for a lie to come out of that truth. Lies can produce more lies, but truth cannot produce lies. Truth is truth. And John is saying you have the truth, you know the truth, your eyes have been opened to the truth. It's exactly what Paul writes about in the book of 1 Corinthians when he talks about how that the natural man understands not the things of God, neither can he understand the things of God, for they are spiritually appraised. And John is saying you can appraise them, you can understand them, you can grasp them because of the ministry of the illumination of the Holy Spirit that will teach you and show you and equip you in truth and prevent you from being led astray by error. So what he's saying here. Fourthly, I want you to see in verses 22 and 23 the denial. John now gives us more ways to recognize those who are of the spirit of Antichrist. Notice in verse 22. So who is the liar? If, if a lie cannot come out of the truth, and I, John, am writing to you, and I'm telling you that I'm telling you the truth, then who is the liar? It is the one who speaks the opposite of what is true. It is the one who promotes Satan's lies about salvation over the Savior's truth. And John says this individual is the one, look at this, verse 22, who denies that Jesus is the Christ. Sir, ma'am, who is here this morning and has been in church all of your life and possibly been attending this church for years but has never accepted the Lord Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, do you not know and realize that you are participating in the spirit of Antichrist? John says anyone who denies that Jesus is the Christ... Now, you've got to come to a fork in the road where you decide in your own heart and mind, Jesus is either a liar, bold-faced liar, in claiming that he is the Son of God and the only way to the Father, the way, the truth, and the life, or he is a lunatic. He was so mad that he thought he was God, he thought he was deity, and you discard him as a liar or a lunatic, or if he is truly Lord and he is who he said he was and is, then we are to bow and confess with every knee and every tongue that Jesus Christ is Lord. Lord. You can't stay middle of the road. You can't straddle the fence. You can't have and live with a dabble do you Christianity and religion and be right with God. He's either Lord of all or he's not Lord at all in your life. This is the Antichrist. The one who denies the Father and the Son, verse 22. The person who denies and rejects that the Father sent his only begotten Son, the only way of salvation, and that by grace through faith in him we can be reconciled to God and, and redeemed and forgiven and atoned for. But to reject that, to deny that, is to participate in the spirit of Antichrist. He goes on in verse 23, Whoever denies the Son does not have the Father. The one who confesses the Son has the Father also. In other words, you can't have the one without the other. 
To deny one is to deny the other. To reject one is to reject the other. Yet also, John says, to have the Son is also to have the Father because they are inseparable. Well, I told you we would go through these quickly if you would listen quickly, and so far you're doing a good job. So let's look fifthly at the duration. Look at verse 24 and 25. Uh, he's given them the warning of the danger in declaring that. He's spoken of the Antichrist's desertion, right? Uh, he's spoken now of the denial of the Antichrist, those who have the spirit of Antichrist. And can I just pause right there before we look at the duration and just say again that that is what the, someone who is lost does. Whether you realize that or not, the Bible speaks of a lost individual being under the sway and power of the prince of this world. It is as though you were virtually upon the leash of the devil. Well, that's why when Paul writes, he writes per adventure that God would grant that lost individual repentance and to be saved out of the snare of the devil. I don't know about you, but I've walked a dog before, and, and that dog think that they are just doing whatever they want and smell this and, 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 and go this way and go that way. And all the while, I'm standing off at a distance holding a rope, holding a leash. And for a while, that dog feels like and thinks that he is free to do whatever he pleases, but he can only go so far, and he feels the tug. He feels the pressure of the leash. And so it is that you may this morning say, Preacher, I've ne never been saved, but I'm not of no spirit of the Antichrist. I, I make my own decisions. No, you're on the devil's leash. And like that dog, you may roam and you may go to and fro and, and think you're doing your own thing. But at the end, the Bible tells us that there's none that doeth good, no, not one. There's none that seeketh after God. There's none righteous. Why is that the case? Because you are so morally depraved. That when it comes time to do what is right and to do what glorifies God, there's always that tug. The tug of the spirit of Antichrist, the tug of the course of this world, the tug, the tug and pull of your own depravity. It is a serious place to be. This is the denial, now the duration. Verse 24, as for you, as he turns back to his readers that are, that are true believers, he says, as for you, let that, let the true gospel abide. Let it remain. Let it continue in you, which you heard from the beginning. Since the beginning of your Christian experience, since when you were first saved, for if what you heard from the beginning abides in you, you also will abide in the Son and in the Father. What is John saying? John is saying that the true believer holds on to the truth, continues in the truth of the gospel, and in doing so, they will remain, they will abide in the Son, in the Father. Let me just show you. In John chapter 8, verse 31, Jesus said this uh, himself to the Jews. If you continue in my word... You are truly disciples of mine. What's the condition? Continuing in his word. Continuing in the truth. Abiding in him who is the truth. And so a true disciple will do that. Do you remember in Colossians chapter 1 when we went verse by verse through that book? That in chapter 1 verses 22 and 23, Paul said, He has now reconciled you in his Christ's fleshly body through death in order to present you before God holy and blameless and beyond reproach. Listen verse 23. If indeed you continue in the faith firmly established and steadfast and not moved away from the hope of the gospel that you have heard. So who is the individual who will be presented before God holy and blameless? 
that the Lord has saved? The individual who continues in the faith, who is firmly established and steadfast in the gospel and does not move away from that gospel. Now this is where false doctrine stems from right here. A miscommunication and understanding of what I've just read. People then jump to the conclusion and they say, Oh, so God saves me and I work to stay saved. And so as long as I do and I believe and I do this and I do that, then my works will keep me saved. No, that's not what he's saying at all. What he's saying is that if you were ever truly saved, that means the root of your faith is firmly rooted in Christ. And because you are rooted in Christ, who is the true vine, and you are abiding in the true vine, you are truly connected in a healthy way to the true vine, then by default you will produce the fruit that a healthy tree will produce. And that's what he's saying. And so if you continue in the truth as you examine yourself to see whether you be in the faith and as you work out your own salvation, as you look on the limbs of your life and examine yourself for the fruit of joy, love, peace, and the fruits of the Spirit, as you examine your limbs, if they are bare, if they are dead, if they only have the wax fruit, of religion taped onto them. But there is not the true fruit, the real fruit that is produced by being connected and in Christ and abiding in Christ. Then what Scripture says is there never was a real root. There was seed that fell on stony ground or there was seed that fell in shallow soil. But when the sun came out and the scorching heat, it died. Why? Because it was not in good soil. And so this is what John is saying here. John is saying, you believers... You're not that shallow soil and you're not that stony ground. You are the ones who are abiding in the truth and you just need to keep abiding. Don't listen to the lies of these antichrists. Don't listen to the, to the um, rhetoric of these Gnostics, of these people who are trying to sound so smart and so educated and, and are claiming all of these special experiences spiritually that you've never... Don't listen to that garbage. You abide in what you know is true. You continue to endure in what you know is right, and that is Jesus Christ. For verse 25, this is the promise which he, Jesus himself, made to us. Eternal life. If and because the truth abides in you, you are truly saved. John is saying you will be protected from deception and we will obtain the promise of eternal life. You don't need to have an angel speak to you. You don't need to have visions and dreams and you don't have to have all of these experiences that these Gnostics and these false teachers even in our day claim to have. You have all that you need. God has given us everything we need for godliness, the Bible says, in his word. If we would just dig into his word and, and hear from Christ and, and, and cry out to Christ and, and in every way, shape, form, and fashion abide in him. Not look for something new, not always look for some new experience, but love him who we have. I feel like many times the way that we leave our first love is not always necessarily worldly things. Many times it is. But I feel like there's another way that we leave our first love, and that is by, by becoming in, uh, consumed and engulfed in the benefits of our first love and seeking new things concerning our first love. In other words, loving the experience of religion more than the relationship with Christ. Does that make sense? 
It, I mean, I, I've met people before who, who were ecstatic, and, and you could see them like Christmas morning, a child on Christmas morning, the, the, the glimmer in their eye when they'd be talking about being slain in the Spirit. But you start talking about the atonement of Christ and what Christ did on the cross, and it's like a deer in the headlights. What? So you're excited about falling on the fish, uh, falling on the floor like a fish out of water, but you're not excited about what Jesus did on the cross of Calvary nearly 2,000 years ago to save you from the torments of an eternal hell and bringing you into the family of God, making you a child of God that you might spend eternity with God in heaven? Now John says... For those who are truly saved, there will be this duration. Six, and finally, I want you to see the duty. So with all that we've seen in mind, what is our duty? What are we to do? What is our responsibility? We understand from the Word of God that salvation is by grace and we can do nothing without Christ. That's what Jesus says in John 15. We can do nothing without Him. We understand that. But that does not mean that we sit in the corner somewhere and we say, let go and let God. While we do nothing but thumb wrestle with ourselves. That's not what the Word of God teaches. There's always responsibility on our part. And so what is our responsibility as we, just like these early church members, were um, being attacked with false doctrine, were being bombarded with false teachings, and they were constantly in this spiritual warfare? What is their responsibility? We see it. In verses 26 and 27. These things I've written to you concerning those who are trying to deceive you. Trying to deceive them how? Trying to deceive them by convincing them of another gospel. Even convincing them of another Jesus. A Jesus who was not truly man. Just appeared to be as a man. These Gnostics denied that Jesus was fully man as well as fully God. They claimed Jesus was just some lower emanation of God, some spiritual higher being that looked like a man. Why is it so important that we not lose that truth? Why is it that we must stand so firmly upon truths such as Jesus being the only God-man who is fully God and fully man? So, preacher, I just don't know. I, I kind of feel like I wasted my Sunday. I mean, if this sermon would have been about how to have a better marriage and, or how to handle finances in a way that glorifies God or something like that, I would have found it to be relevant and helpful. But all this about Antichrist and the doctrine, and I just don't see how that's helpful and how that's relevant to me. It's very relevant and it's very helpful because when you err from truth, you're in the realm of lies. And John says in chapter 4 and verse 2 of this book, by this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. When you change the truths about Jesus, you no longer have the real Jesus. When you say Jesus was just all spirit and not man, you've got another Jesus besides the Jesus of the Bible. When you say Jesus is all love and, you know, you've got him wearing skinny jeans with long feathery hair running through the tulips, you know, singing skip to my loo and, and, and there's no sovereignty and lordship to him and, and all, you've got another Jesus. There's always the biblical balance of who he is. He is very loving and, and he is very gracious, but he is also Lord. And so John says, I'm writing these things concerning those who are trying to deceive you. As for you, so what do you do with this church? As for you, the anointing which you receive from him abides in you. You have the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is remaining in you. He is continuing his work in you. Look at verse 27. And you have no need for anyone to teach you. Now, we understand from the analogy of faith that uh, Scripture does not 
contradict Scripture. Scripture always interprets Scripture. So John is definitely not saying that you don't need a pastor and you don't need a teacher. You can just go and have your own thing with God and all of that. That's not what he's saying. Why do we know that? How do we know that? Because when we look in Ephesians chapter 4, we see the Word of God saying that God has given gifts to the church and those gifts are apostles, prophets, teachers, pastors, right? For the equipping, for the training up of the body so that the body can go out and do the work of the ministry, right? Right? So we know that's not what he's saying. What then is John saying when he says you have the anointing and you're abiding in the truth, abiding in him, you have no need for anyone to teach you. What does he say? He's saying you don't need somebody to teach you something new. You don't need the Book of Mormon, some new revelation that's supposed to be an addition to the Word of God. You don't need Joseph Smith. You don't need Sun Yon Moon. You don't need the Jesse Duplantises of the world who are having special revelations and walks with Jesus in heaven after being shuttled there by a spaceship with an angel, which is his testimony. You don't need that garbage. Ignore that garbage. You have the Holy Spirit, which is the best teacher, greatest teacher, who will never lead you astray, who will never bring to your heart, to your mind, lies, but will always be the truth. And so as his anointing teaches you about all things, verse 27, all things spiritual and is true and is not a lie, and just as it, it being the ministry of the Holy Spirit illuminating you, just as it has taught you, Here's your responsibility. You see it? You abide in Him. Boy, you thought it'd be something more exciting, didn't you? Maybe, maybe my responsibility would be to make a, a trip to the Holy Land and spend X number of hours at the prayer, a wall of prayer. Or, or maybe I would have to climb up the steps of, of some high temple and penance. Or I'd have to do something, Right? No, friend, that's the glory of the gospel. It all goes back to Christ every time. It goes back to Christ. Where is your rest in Christ? Where is your protection in Christ? Where should you rely? Who should you rely upon? Rely upon Christ. Where is your hope found? In Christ. Christ plus nothing. And Christ minus nothing, just all of Christ and going deeper in love and deeper in a relationship with Christ that we might have a more intimate walk with Him. That's what we need. Not to be caught up by the circus clowns of religion in our day, but to hold firmly and to hold dearly and to hold tenaciously to the Lord Jesus Christ. This morning in closing, I can sum up all of these verses by three primary things, and they are these. We're in the last hour, and it's a, it's a time of great deception. Number two, the Word of God and the Spirit of God will protect those who are His from that deception and will lead us faithfully to eternal life. For he will accomplish that which he began in us. Philippians 1.6 And third and finally, therefore, we as God's people should let the word of God abide in us and we should abide in the Spirit, abide in Christ and hold dear to that and not be swayed, and not be lured away by the attractions or even the amusements of this world. That's what we have. That's what these verses mean. This morning, if you're not saved and you're here this morning and you've never had a place in your life where the Lord Jesus Christ has come into your heart, where hell's moved out and heaven's moved in, so to speak, You've never had a moment in your life when, when your sins have been fully forgiven and you've known the peace, the peace that only comes from the Prince of Peace, the Lord Jesus Christ. 
The good news is the last hour is not up yet. He's still in the saving business. And where sin does abound, grace does much more abound, so that even if you're the chief of sinners, as Paul was, there's still grace enough for you. There's forgiveness for that sin. There's a peace that surpasses all understanding to be found in Christ. And it can be yours if you will simply repent of your sin and place your faith in Him. Well, there would be nothing more, there would be nothing to be more thankful for on Thanksgiving than that the Lord saved me today. Let's pray.